and you could say this, Two Kinds of Saints, Craig, is the title of it, Two Kinds of Saints. Okay, Ephesians chapter 1. In the work of the ministry, there's an issue that's critical to understand if you're involved in that ministry. And it's critical to understand it. Um, it took me a long time to fathom it and uh, come to terms with it. And if you look at Ephesians 1.1, 1, 1, look how Paul says this. Paul, an epistle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints which are at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. So, what are the two kinds of saints that you have there? What's the collective The saints which are at Ephesus is the collective, right? So we got two kinds of saints. And here's the two kinds. They're saints. They're saved. Okay? They're saved folks because they did what? They trusted in the gospel. And God the Holy Spirit took up re residence in them, right? Right? And the ultimate redemption of that purchased possession is going to be what? A body functioning in the heavenly places. What's the second one? Faithful. Let me ask you this. Is that your experience in the church? That they're saints. They're saved. We say they're justified. They're declared right. They have this position in the heavenly places. Are all saints faithful? No. Those are the two kinds of saints. Justified saints, faithful saints. Uh, you can go to a lot of churches today. You know, Baal, Baal worship is dominating in our culture right now. I mean, you can go from the Baal church and all the denominations and the parts and pieces of Baal worship that they incorporate Right? Even what so called Bible believers, um, so called, they don't really call them Bible believers anymore, but churches where people carry something that looks like a Bible, right? But uh, they don't know what God's doing today, and they're taking people in the wrong direction. Car they're carnal places, they're places that employ the flesh to serve God, okay? And there are saints that are faithful today. You can be faithful. Uh, a, a faithful saint wherever you are, okay, corporately, as a local assembly, you could be a faithful saint. You might not know much, but you desire to know more. And you naturally function in the Lord on the basis of, we say, like, we're going to have that summer conference, I'm going to be at it this, this year, and um, one, of the, one of the missions of this assembly is... The principal thing is wisdom. Therefore, get wisdom. And with all that getting, get what? Understanding is what produce, produces conviction, assurance. We say eternal security, much more. Sanctificational security as to your capacity to function for all eternity in the Lord. Okay? Um... Look at Colossians 2.6. Colossians 2.6. Colossians 2.6. And you need, for ministry's sake, to wrap your head around this so that you can serve others in the ministry. I mean, what's the Lord desire? Just saints or faithful saints? I mean, He desires that, but only in that it what results in this, right here, faithful. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 2. What's the Lord desire? The Lord would have all men what? And come to a knowledge of the... We call that edification. To a point of functioning maturity, you can reach functioning maturity and you still got to be what? Faithful. In your service to the Lord in the moments that make up your life. Literally, the moments that make up your life. Uh, Colossians 2.6. Colossians 
As ye that have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did you receive him? By doing what? Faith. Believing. How do you continue to function in him? The same way. Believing. You got saved by believing. You continue in him by believing the same thing. And that's his word. What ought you do before you believe it is the question. Okay? And we'll get to that. Look at Philippians 1. Philippians 1. Verse 27. Philippians 1, verse 27. The River Church here. Okay? Lydia, you remember? The origin of this church, local assembly. He says in verse 27, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Okay? Well, the gospel of Christ is what? His faithfulness. So if your conversation is going to be peppered with something... Uh, I shouldn't say peppered. If it's going to be the substance of something, it ought to be what Christ did on the cross. Okay? And the fact that you believed it. Your conversation ought to be aimed at our strength, our resource, our abundance, our sufficiency in Christ. He says, because that's all you trusted in, right? You didn't trust in anything else. All you trusted in is what he did on the cross at Calvary. That's why Paul says, remember Romans 1, 1, uh, 17, from faith to faith. Our conversation ought to be about his faith and trust in it. Um, that whether I come and see you or be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast. We're going to go back at that stand fast series I was doing in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. If the word of God is the object of your faith, and you know what God's doing today, that's important. You know, we say right division, but it, it's it's that's just that's just the meth that's just the mode. The issue is what he's doing today. Do you know? Right division's how you get there. Right? Rightly dividing time, past, from but, now, etc. Um, note, he says, whether I'm there or not, whether I'm watching your affairs or I hear of your affairs, that you're what? You're all standing fast. We've talked about stand fast and what's that mean. Is stand fast loosey-goosey at all? Is stand fast resilient? This, I mean, you're in harbor, Despite the storm, that ship stays right where it was. Safe. Stand fast. Don't be moved by anything else. Don't be moved by anything else. Some might call that stubborn. Yeah, I'm stubborn about the Word of God and what it says. If you want to be stubborn about the wisdom of men, go for it. Whatever you think is right because you say so, go for it. Stand fast in the truth of what God's doing today. He says, in one mind. That's unison, isn't it? Can you function in a ministry if there isn't unison? And if you know what God's doing today, is God doing something in your mind today different than what it's doing in another saint in the church's mind today? God isn't. That might exist, that situation, but is God doing the same thing? He's doing the thing that he said he's doing, period. And there's a lot to that, but if that's what he's doing, that's what I'm doing. Well, I'm doing this. Well, go ahead and do that. But don't think I'm going to bend to it, because I won't. And if you don't like me, that's okay. You know how many people don't like me? Because I'm trying to stand fast. When I grew up, I was a pleaser. That's how I was. Didn't have any confidence. 
the thought of publicing, public speaking would send me into a, a tizzy. And I hated the fact that my name was Wilcher, W, and I was always the last one, you know, to get up and do anything that was in the neighborhood of public speaking. I tried to stay back in the shadow, sit in the back. I did not want. I was insecure. And I, I was a pleaser. Well, quite frankly, I'm the opposite now. And I'm thankful for it. And I rejoice in it. And I don't care if I'm commended by men. What's going to matter? What really are we already... It's already happened. Eternity. Do you think this little window is going to mean much? Only in that how you function in the window, in the temporal time, for eternity is going to matter. Because it's the equipment you're going to take into eternity. Anything that's faithful, a faithful saint of the Lord Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. Colossians, Philippians uh, chapter uh, 1, verse 27, he says... Whether absent or I may hear of your affairs, uh, whether I'm absent, whether I be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in the one spirit with one mind. Um, the spirit, it's interesting, one spirit. You have a spirit, and that spirit is your mentality, what you know. So not only what you know, he says here, but then function with one mind. We all have our minds focused on the same thing so we can walk in unison. Striving together for the faith of the gospel. If we're striving towards something, what is it? We say our mission for the gospel of grace of God to keep it set forth. And say, well, we're going to have to do this to get more folks. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to do this. We're going to have to compromise. Is there any compromise in the word of God? Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Any compromise there? Like, well, what if we throw out this word and interject this one? There's no compromise there. They're all the same words in everybody's book if they know where the book is. Quite frankly, things that say Bible on them today aren't God's word. Say, well, there's some words of God in there. Well, Romans 11.6 says, if it's... Works, it's no more what? Grace. And if it's grace, it's no more what? Works. If it's the Word of God, and you need every word to function, how much change do I have to do to the Word of God to take away all that we have? I can do it with a preposition in the right place. He goes on to say in verse 28, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Down in your soul, regardless of what they come up with, you're not terrified. Where you're no longer cognizant of who you are in Christ and what your hope is. They can't get at you, can they? I mean... We look at it in time and we go, well, right now I got blood going through those nerve endings and that hurt. Right? But actually they're just poking dust. You can, you can poke at dust all you want. What's going to change? Nothing. And that's what these bodies are. We're not terrified by them because they can't touch us. They can't touch us. Two-thirds of us, they can't touch. Maybe can chemically destroy your mind and your soul. Oh, well. Where am I going? Does the Lord know whose are His? Got a verse? Great verse for this. 2 Timothy Chapter 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are 
His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now he goes on into sanctification. But Romans chapter 8, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're not one of His, are you? What's the seal we have? God the Holy Spirit. And the Lord knows, knows those that are His. There's nothing we need to be terrified by. It goes on to say in Romans 8, what can separate us from the love of Christ? There's a list there. And it's everything you could possibly come up with, and none of it can separate you from what? The love of Christ. So, should I be terrified? No. It's only if I function in the flesh in the moment that I'm going to be terrified. You know, that's why Paul says, be instant in prayer. Think about who you are all the time. Don't ever forget it. Paul goes on to say in Philippians 1, And nothing terrified by your adversaries, which is to them an evident token of perdition. When they look at you, they say, that's a sign of a destroyed person. Look at that idiot. Can a saint look? A saint under persecution, in the wrong place at the wrong time, the wrong nation, the wrong place. Can a saint look like a complete down and outer? Completely destroyed? You'd walk past them and go, what an idiot, look at them. Because you have this false idea in America that prosperity has something to do with who you are in Christ. That'd be a foolish assumption. Yet, I would, I would guess that many would, would think that way. I know there's philanthropic um, things that go on in the church and, uh, you know, those that are, that are down on their circumstances, you know. But uh, they don't need to be placated by you. They need the truth. They need to hear the truth. That's what we did down at the mission. We gave those guys truth, and they got their bologna sandwich and vitamins. But we gave them the truth of the gospel. And some of those men got saved. And Russ Youngstrom helped them in the Lord. And those men had seen some hard things. Been through some hard things. And those stories would affect you. Um, he goes on to say, okay, there are those that are going to take what you look like to them as a sign of who you are. Just nothing. Destroyed. But to you of salvation and that of God. That's what they think, but what do you think? Salvation from what? My sins. My sin. Salvation of my conduct. My walk. Equipping me for all eternity with the capacity to give praise and honor and glory to the only one that's going to matter in this universe because He's all there is in this universe that is life, eternal life. 4, verse 29, Unto you it is given on the behalf of Christ not only to believe on Him, but to suffer. Now, faithful saints believe, right? Faithful saints believe. What else comes to faithful saints? Suffer. Now, what do you got to know about that? Let's see. It's easy for us to do the wrong thing and claim that we're suffering for God, isn't it? <laughs> so do we have to be cautious with that one? Yeah, the heart's deceitful above all things. I wouldn't think that there would be anything more dangerous than you without the Word of God letting the old sin nature deceive you. I'll read a verse. Look at 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse 14, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ, 
Happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, but on your part he is glorified. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or as a thief or an evildoer or as a busybody in other men's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him, but let him glorify God on this behalf. In other words, you should be able to identify your sin. And if your circumstances are the result of that, that's not glory to God, is it? And that's not suffering for his sake. Go back to Philippians chapter 1. For unto you, verse 29, it is given on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me, and now here to be in me. Paul's a prisoner. He's in prison as an evildoer, and the Philippians are hearing about it, aren't they? And he says, wasn't I with you? Wasn't I suffering this distress when I was with you? Why should you be surprised when you hear about my situation? Do you immediately judge not being present or aware of, the, uh, of what happened or listening to only one side of the equation, those that are after Paul? That I'm suffering for my own sin as an evildoer here in prison? You see what he's saying? I was with you and I was suffering this. Now you hear about it. Are you going to just make these quick? Oh, Paul, I guess he's, he's off the wagon. He's left the faithful ranks and he's suffering for his own wrongdoing. And that's what they're trying to say. And that's what he's saying to the Philippians, not so. And my own example and what I suffered when I was with you is evident and should be to all of you. Because here's the deal. Suffering faithfully gives us a capacity to reign not Lord over. See, that's immediately what the, the sinner's mind does, right? Like, you can't be in charge without being evil. Mm, that's kind of true in this life. Because <laughs> you take your sin with you, don't you? Into that office. But is it true of him? It's not. He's righteous in all his ways and all his works. Um, do you, Show me a verse that says, if we faithfully suffer circumstances for his name's sake, what's the result? We'll be able to glorify him exactly. We'll have a capacity to do that. But will we, what will we be doing in heaven? People say, what will we be doing? Well, take a look at 2 Timothy 2. Yes, Romans 8. Yes, that's true. That's right, Joyce. That's one of the passages to go to. In fact, I'll go there. You go to 2 Timothy 2, and I'll read Romans 8, where Joyce is referring to. Acts 17 says this, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Joint heirs. If I'm a joint heir to the Lord Jesus Christ and function in that capacity in the heavenly places, what am I going to be doing? Take a look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also what? Live with him. That's a reference to our baptism, right? Our eternal security. The seal. We're one of his. If we suffer, we shall also what? If we continue believing and suffer, which is going to happen one way or the other, we're kind of insulated in this culture on, to, to some circumstances, but all you've got to do is be in the wrong, you know, say the wrong thing in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right? And you could be unjustly, what, persecuted, correct? Tebow was okay until he said he was a Christian. Then what happened? What do you think would have happened if he, if he didn't say that? 
That's just a, not one of the more recent examples of that. But look what it says here. Um, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also... What's the next word? And everybody goes, Oh boy, I get to be a boss! <laughs> Listen, reigning with Him has to do with servanthood. What's changed? It has to do with servanthood. Your capacity to serve Him in His eternal purpose in the heavenly places. And you'll be able to do it with a capacity to serve with others and direct them in the faithful capacity that you develop down here. Just like a mortar and pestle. You know? I mean, this is a, this is a trial period for eternity. And you can only take with you what you faithfully, what? Assimilate in Him. Because that's what you're going to take to the heavenly places. And you'll have a capacity to exalt Him. Paul says, you are the crown of my rejoicing. What do you do with a crown? If it's Paul's crown, what's he doing? He's taking that crown, right? He's got it. He's got that crown because he faithfully served, right? And then he's taking that crown and he's throwing it to the dais at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Any capacity we have to reign, to glorify Him, to give Him honor, to praise Him, to accompany vessels of His purpose in that sinless reality. Right? Anything we had to do is all about Him glorifying Him we'll have a greater capacity to glorify Him. And we can reign as one to do just that. And that's all anybody's going to want to do in the heavenly places, you know. Praising Him, giving Him honor, glorifying Him is all anybody's going to be doing there. Bottom line. Romans 8 says the same thing, but notice it goes on to say, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. That's this first category right here. Okay? You're still what? If you're not faithful and you don't serve him, does that mean that he didn't die for you when, and that you didn't trust in it? And that you didn't receive the seal? You're eternally secure. You're declared right by the justice of God. He cannot deny himself. But verse 12 is where you want to be. Verse 12 is where you want to be. Not to mention the fact that if you're, and this is something, boy, it's not, I don't have any secrets about this in terms of my life and, and failing and etc. But if you want joy in your Christian life, despite the circumstances, you know how things are going good and you've got a lively step going on, right? And then when things aren't going good, everything's black, you know? Depression. Notice it says in verse 13, Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in what? The way you get peace despite the circumstances, the way you have joy, a deep abiding reason to rejoice, is not based on anything in this life or the circumstances. It's based on faith, being faithful, believing. And when you leave that camp, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Romans 8 says this. 8.13 says, For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. It's talking about your Christian experience. Your life in Christ, experienced in this, these bodies of flesh. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. There's a difference between walking in the flesh and walking according to the Spirit, isn't there? Being led of the Spirit, there's a difference. No joy? What's a good guess? You're not what? You're not believing. What are you focusing on the basis of? Probably your circumstances. Not good, huh? And some of the worst things that happen, they're not physical. They're what? They're spiritual. If you have trouble with... What's the worst trouble you can have in this life, in your own strength? What's one of the worst troubles you can have? 
trouble with the people you love. We, we would say secularly, your family, death, whatever it is. Isn't that the worst you suffer in this life? Your family? What's well, a local church? It's your family. And that's the worst of it. You know, that's the worst of it. Suffering without them that are without die. Can I expect them to understand me? Do I try to explain myself to them? Why? Why? Always try to think of a verse. Get your mind flowing. You just said it. What's, what's the passage? <laughs> First Corinthians chapter, chapter 2, verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are what to him? Not only can't they understand them and they just dismiss them, they're utter foolishness. I sit there with the things of God and I try to make an unsafe person understand my motivations within the things of God that I have by faith alone. What are they going to say? Moron! Right? Foolish. Stupid. Idiot. I mean, the things I've heard through the years of people. You know, I remember this guy that helped me early, early, early in the Lord. And people would say nasty things to him. Or, and one of the things that had a powerful effect on me, this is before I was, before I, I guess I was saved. I knew him both unsaved and saved. Um, I mocked him in a room one day. You know, I mocked him in a college dorm room. I don't even say what it is. It just makes me so mad. And I mocked him. But that's the same guy that I hooked up with to help grow, you know, start on the road to growing. And yeah, he couldn't get me where I needed to be you know, in terms of right division, what God's doing today. But it's a start. And I used to watch him, how people would say things to him and he'd just laugh. Not mocking laugh, but just giggle and laugh. You know, Not take it seriously. Not take it to heart. Now within... It's hard not to take it to heart, is it? Because what do you have in common? Same mind, same spirit. So you, you want unity within. Can you have that? No, because there's two kinds of saints. <laughs> you can't have that, can you? But you can do what? Function toward that end, right? With folks. Do you give them a lot of time? Sure you do. Do you want it for them? No, the Lord wants it for them. You're serving Him. And you've learned how to do that faithfully. And you have the motivations, the equipment to do it. It's called grace. Here's the difference between two saints. What makes them different? What makes them different? What makes them different? Uh, we'll do that in the second half here. Okay, Craig. This is basic uh, stuff for, for a small crowd, but when I say basic, I don't think saints contemplate all this, really.